did you know Nevada received a D- grade in a recent state integrity study by the Center for Public Integrity, Global Integrity and Public Radio International making Nevada one of the worst states in the nation for corruption? Yes, I did hear about that on the news and the Nevada anti-corruption movement protests taking place all over Nevada and primarily at the state capitol in Carson City. I am glad to hear someone is standing up to the rampant, wholesale, corruption in Nevada. Corruption is very serious. It costs taxpayers a fortune and corruption kills. In the past, Nevada had a high rate of murder because of people solving their issues with guns. In the modern world, we have courts to solve the disputes. However, the courts have become infested with rampant, wholesale, corruption and the judges, the attorney general, the district attorneys and lawyers are all in collusion against innocent people. The rules do not matter and your rights no longer matter in this corrupt system. Essentially it is tyranny and treason. Sure, many cases may seemingly not experience such blatant corruption, but cases that are political in nature are ripe with corruption. Yes, I have heard of the Nevada Attorney General Catherine Cortez Masto and the Washoe District Attorney Dick Gamak are very, very corrupt and scandal-ridden. That's right. The state of Nevada also retaliates against whistleblowers. If you expose any kind of corruption, chances are you will suffer retaliation. That's why citizens of Nevada united against this corruption and retaliation are taking a stand and demanding justice and exposing the corruption. The Nevada anti-corruption movement consists of many people who have had corruption affect them directly. Most of the corruption stems from Nevada state officials and is covered up by the Attorney General Catherine Cortez Masto. That is all correct, and validated by the news media, official state documents and court records. In fact, the state is in contempt of the Nevada Supreme Court for disregarding orders, yet nothing happens to them. A.G. Masto prides herself on going after banks for criminally backdating court documents and robo-signing yet her office backdates court documents. There was also rampant corruption in the Department of Taxation, and whistleblowers were fired for reporting misconduct costing taxpayers millions of dollars. The only thing people can do is take the matters to a corrupt court where the odds are stacked against them and, protest, on the streets. The more high profile these protests get, the more chances of exposing the crime to the public and removing these people from office and having them incarcerated for fraud. Traditionally protesting does work and produce public awareness of the issues. This is true, and I want to show my support for the Nevada anti-corruption movement by joining them at their next protest. I will also honk my horn every time I see them protesting. I will also call their offices and I will let them know the taxpayers are not happy to hear about these problems. I will also write letters to my political representatives and letter to the editor of my local newspaper voicing my support for the anti-corruption movement and my disgust with the rampant wholesale corruption and the D-minus grade by the Center for Public Integrity here in Nevada. The Nevada anti-corruption movement will continue to hold massive demonstrations with their supersized signs, the popular Nanag Masto portrait and their one of a kind, and now world famous. 140 long 4 foot tall crime scene banner. The movement also created websites and YouTube videos to provide information. See Nevada State Personnel Watch.wordpress.com for more information. Tonya Brown lost her brother, Nolan Klein, who died in a Nevada state prison for a crime he did not commit and due to withheld, exculpatory, Evidence proving his innocence by Nevada Attorney General, Catherine Cortez Masto, and Washoe County and City of Reno District Attorney, Dick Gimmick. This is a criminal violation of the Brady Disclosure Act. Brady, v. Maryland, was a landmark United States Supreme Court case from 1963 in which the prosecution had withheld from the criminal defendant certain evidence. The defendant challenged his conviction arguing it had been contrary to the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. These violations of due process are simply a repulsive criminal act and the perpetrators must be held accountable. Essentially it is tyranny, a war against the Constitution, and tyranny is a capital crime. Nevada Attorney General, Catherine Cortez Masto, and, Reno District Attorney, 
the Gamak are responsible for this tragedy. Their YouTube videos are generating interest and have gone viral with over 20,000 hits in a short time. The mainstream media also widely covered the anti-corruption movement on both TV news and the local newspapers and many other internet blogs. The war is getting out there, and the movement will get bigger with more frequent high-profile protests and occupying the public comment sections of various open government meetings exposing the crimes one by one and step by step. The tyranny and treason must end, Governor Brian Sandoval, we are in a state of corruption, get your head out of the sand. A modern day warrior, mean, mean stride, today's Tom Sawyer, mean, mean pride.
Good day fellow Americans and the rest of the world. My name is George Washington, and I served as the first president of the United States of America. I am quoted as saying, if freedom of speech is taken away, then dumb and silent we may be led, like sheep to the slaughter, as you have witnessed in this video. Nevada is one of the worst states for nearly everything, including corruption. I am ashamed of the current state of corruption and the rampant, wholesale, corruption in every branch of Nevada government and starting from the top, down. This is a disgrace to everything this great country was founded on. I applaud those who are standing up to the tyrants and expressing their First Amendment right to protest and demand justice. Those who have committed crimes must be held accountable to effect the change Nevada so desperately needs. I remind you that the United States of America was born out of protest and revolution, the American Revolution. We will show you some more highlights of other Nevada anti-corruption videos and news footage. More information can be found at NevadaStatePersonnelWatch.wordpress.com and NevadaWikileaks.wordpress.com. More protests are planned for the duration and until the issues are resolved. Some demonstrations will be promoted ahead of time and others will be spontaneous so we can keep the protest unpredictable and high profile. Thank you for watching and please stay tuned to see highlights from our previous demonstrations and YouTube videos. God bless America. I was driving through downtown Carson City this morning. We're greeted by an unusual sight. It was another capital city protest, but this one featured a half dozen demonstrators holding a huge crime scene tape in front of the attorney general's office. Their individual complaints range from allegations of suppression of evidence to harassment by highway patrol troopers to failure to protect whistleblowers in state government. But they are united in their belief that the state justice system is corrupt and officials aren't doing anything about it. They cite a recent study that ranked Nevada 42nd among states for legal protections against corruption. Well, people driving through downtown Carson City are accustomed to seeing people brandishing signs, protesting various issues. But they've never seen a huge crime scene tape deployed in front of the Attorney General's office. The banner and various other signs were the work of a group of people united by their collective belief 
that the Nevada justice system is corrupt. Their complaints range from alleged suppression of evidence by Washoe DA Dick Gamak to failure to support whistleblowers in state government. All of them pointed to a recent study that ranked Nevada 42nd among the states for risk of corruption due to lack of legal restraints and transparency. Comment on the protest? No comment? What about the corruption? Miss Pasto? it up. <laughs> Está echadita. Oiga, señor. We are federales. You know. The mountain police. If you're the police, where are your badges? Badges? We ain't got no badges. We don't need no badges. I don't have to show you any stinking badges. Better not come any closer. No sea tonto, hombre. We didn't try to do you any harm. Why don't you try to be a little more polite? Because you're gone, and we leave you in peace. I need my gun myself. Oh, uh, throw that old light on over here. We'll pick it up and go Norway. You go anyway without my gun and go quick. He's not even releasing a plan to solve the state's budget woes. He ran on a platform that included what he called a secret plan. No, we're, we're still working. You're going to be reading a bit today about your secret plan. Some might call that irresponsible or arrogant. We have the power to demonstrate to the people of Nevada that honest, civil, and responsive government is alive and well in Carson City. Finally, I will explore resources and services available through the Nevada Judicial College, the Attorney General's Office, and other state agencies to ensure that all agencies with rulemaking and regulatory authority take advantage of appropriate training. Through continued hard work, transparency, and clarity, each and every one of us in this chamber can take steps to send a clear message to our constituents. This is the people's government. We are but stewards. The Nevadans have every right to hold us to high standards of conduct and responsiveness. May 25, 2012, dear Governor Sandoval, you are not morally qualified to preside over the lives of 2.7 million 
fellow human beings or any number. A decent person holding the office of governor of Nevada would do a number of things that you would never give any serious thought to doing. Context. Nevada recently received a D- report card grade following an in-depth study by Public Radio International, the Center for Public Integrity and Global Integrity. The D- focuses on Nevada government having no integrity. Nevada government is corrupt, Brian, extremely corrupt. Whose desk does that D- land on, Brian? In case you want to plead stupidity, that D- has been excreted on your desk. If you cared one iota about this, you would go on national television and apologize with tears in your eyes for not moving one inch in the direction of making changes. This writer can hear you laughing, Brian. Again, in case you want to pretend stupidity, you can't. You cannot say with any credibility that you inherited serious problems from Gwen and Gibbons and you haven't had enough time in office to deal with them. Before moving to the governor's mansion, you insulted the office of attorney general for a number of years. As AG, you could not have helped learning how dirty our state's inner workings are. To be realistic, the state's controlling criminal elite would not have put you in the AG's office in the first place if you were not friendly to them, if you were not their kind of people. Did you attempt any improvements within our dirty state government while AG, Brian? The answer is no. You were content with the corrupt judges and Supreme Court justices, violations of the Constitution, violations of due process, violations of judicial canons, and gross insults against truth and justice. And good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. A Carson City man says the court clerk there is illegally backdating judicial filings for the state attorney general. And he's only sharing those claims with News 4's Ben Briscoe, who joins us now live in the studio with the details. Ben. Before you hear what proof this man says he has, you should know the clerk's office declined an on-camera interview with us where they could explain their side of the story. And when you listen to this, please keep in mind you're only hearing one point of view the only perspective that's willing to go on camera. It's all new at 5. I think the proof is very solid. Todd Robbins says this court filing by the Attorney General's office in his wrongful termination case against the State Department of Taxation was dated in time to meet a procedural deadline, December 20th. But it wasn't actually turned over to the court until at least the next day after that deadline. The document wasn't in the file. On the afternoon of December 21st, Robin had a legal processor check to see if the document had been filed on time. A court clerk worker then signed this certified docket report for the case, showing the brief was not in their computer system yet. That legal processor also submitted this affidavit, swearing the clerk's office spent 40 minutes looking to make sure it wasn't in their hard copy files either. According to both these documents, no record of the brief was found on the 21st, but that filing in question is still stamped, saying it was there on the 20th. It's a big public concern because he, uh, the, the public has, has a right to a fair court system. The clerk's office manager, Max Cortez, declined an on-camera interview, faxing over this handwritten official statement, reading, Because this case is on appeal with the Supreme Court, I am unable to make any comments. She also attached this two-paragraph letter sent from the clerk's office to Robin, reading, After reviewing your case file, I have found no discrepancies. However, after the commercial started running promoting our story, the court manager did call News 4 back to explain procedurally how a document could come in one day but not be in the system until a few days later. For example, say a filing comes in on Friday afternoon. Well, then it will be physically stamped Friday the 13th. But if it's not something that's due in court until down here, the clerks might set it aside and get back to it Monday to be entered into the electronic system. Now say they're super slammed again on Monday. 
The court administrator says it could even theoretically be Tuesday the 17th before that document coming in on the 13th actually gets filed electronically. The Attorney General's office also declined an on-camera interview with the statement that these allegations are, as a matter of law, not true. Court documents were properly filed. Do you think it's possible this was just sitting in a file somewhere and hadn't gone into the system yet? Every clerk was, was checked, and then the law clerk and the judge, I believe even the judge. Um, we, I stand by it. The, the document wasn't filed. Why would the clerk do this? Why would they risk their career for this? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, well, first of all, if, if you do miss a filing date, the case could be thrown out. Okay. Robin also said the judge in the case was good friends with one of the defendants. He adds that the judge, James Wilson Jr., refused to investigate the possible backdating. And court records obtained by the fact finder team show the judge then signed this order, saying Robin's conduct was disruptive and counterproductive. Robin was also not allowed to call, write, email, or otherwise communicate directly with court staff after that. <laughs> News 4 has been calling the judge for more than a week, and he still hasn't gotten back to us for comment. And Robin says he's speaking out to us now because there's nowhere else to go for help. And he hopes there will be a public outcry after this story. And all I'm asking for is an investigation into the matter. I haven't accused anybody specifically um, in the court but there has to be an investigation. And to give you a little more context about the man making these claims, he also says he's contacted the FBI about the possible backdating and filed a judicial ethics complaint against the judge. And in addition to that, he has an appeal in the Nevada Supreme Court about his case. A hearing date for that has not yet been set. Live in the studio, Ben Briscoe, News 4. A federal lawsuit has been filed against the Department of Public Safety, NHP, and a list of others claiming the state's Department of Public Safety director, Chris Perry, systematically destroyed the department's gold standard of a canine program. News Force Karen Griffin is here with more on the suit. Karen? Joe, according to attorney Ken McKenna, who filed the lawsuit for two Nevada Highway Patrol officers and the dog trainer who was once contracted for that program, Perry sabotaged the program. And now the NHP dogs are no longer trained to alert for drugs, but instead, according to McKenna's lawsuit, they are trained to respond to their handler's cues. The lawsuit claims the result is improper and illegal searches of citizens and the illegal seizure of money and property, even when drugs aren't found. McKenna says the illegal search and seizure can begin with a simple traffic violation. Sometimes they confiscate money, personal property, even the vehicles, and there are no drugs because the dog falsely alerted because he was cued by the handler. These are criminal illegal violations of people's rights in the Fourth Amendment. Essentially stealing from people. Essentially stealing from people. If you or I did that, we'd be in prison. We did talk with Trooper Chuck Allen with the Nevada Highway Patrol to get their side of the story. Now, because this is an open case, he couldn't discuss specifics, but he told me that Director Perry calls this a baseless lawsuit brought by employees who are disgruntled with a management decision. Joe? This dash cam video from inside a Nevada Highway Patrol car shows a police stop gone bad. A motorist suffering from diabetic shock and driving erratically, thought to be intoxicated, pulled from his car at gunpoint, then beaten by police, including one who kicks him in the head. It's alarming. It's egregious. Um, it'll, it'll make you a little sick to your stomach watching it. The attorney for Adam Green and his wife say the couple will get a little less than $300,000 to settle their lawsuit against the Henderson Police Department and the state of Nevada. 
Police got a clue there would be trouble when they called an ambulance. We found some insulin in his pocket. Rule 52, tell me that. He's uh, semi-conscious. This was a traumatic event for him, and I think anyone who sees the video would, would understand why. After an internal investigation, Henderson police modified their training and use of force policies, and an officer at the scene was disciplined. Green was heading back to work when the incident happened. He suffered cuts, bruises, and broken ribs. Ross Simpson, The Associated Press. Take him on the wrist so I can get him out. Do not move! Hey, driver, do not move! Shit, cross moving. I got it, I got it! Go ahead. Get on the ground. Get on the ground! Stop resisting, motherfucker! Stop resisting, motherfucker! Oh! 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 Quick, time to I'm getting cut to right now for 43. I got it. I got it. Just worry about him. George 4692. George 4692. George 4692. All right, we got him. Roll me a, uh, a 51. And look the cover. 757, you guys got him, one in custody. Over two is clear code red at 419. Anybody hurt? Anybody hurt? Uh, I don't think we should be medical. George 4692. George 4692. All right, we have a, we found some insulin in his pocket. Rule 52, tell him to expedite. He's uh, semi-conscious. I got him. Thank you. Anybody hurt, guys? What about you, Troop? No, I'm good. You good? Stay on your feet. Yeah, I see that. Hey, we got medical coming through. If you can... Hey, George, 4692. George, 4692, go ahead. All right, let's get medical out of here. He's a, uh, a diabetic. He's probably in a shock. Semi-conscious. Yeah, no, we did good.
citation for $300. Uh, I had stopped to bring to attention of this particular trooper, which I didn't know who he was at the time, uh, regarding a couple reckless drivers on I-80 near Reno. I want to look at your eyes. No, 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 stand up, stand up. Yes, I see you. Okay. Okay, yeah, we're right there. My wife, my your name was. We're right there. These pickups, these issue bays, they terrorize me. My wife, my wife, my your name was. Listen to me, your name was. I want you to sit in your car. I'll be right back to talk to you, okay? Yeah, I just tried it. Wait for me, okay? Get your driver's license. Yeah, yeah. Minute seven. And I stopped to give him the description and information, and he turned around after a while and recognized my voice from the phone call uh, complaint that I brought against those two off those two troopers. And he ordered me in front of the camera a second time his audio, his video camera on his uh, car and restaged the, the verbal exchange to where it made it look like I was there just to bother him for no reason. It's most of every one of the minutes have either the seconds in each minute or down to you know, anywhere from 5 seconds to 15, 20, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, and then some minutes go over um, 75 uh, seconds, 55 or 65 seconds, and it's a clear paper trail of uh, audio video tampering, we're talking about wholesale rampant judicial corruption in the state of Nevada and it's getting worse uh, and uh, people have to stand up and fight the system. I'm not giving up. I'm putting this on YouTube and and I'm, we're putting up huge uh, demonstrations in front of the Attorney General Masto in Carson City and Governor Sandoval and we're getting them pretty upset with our protests. So what have you learned as a legal intern? Outcomes in court do not seem to have much to do with the merits of law or the evidence. Welcome to the real world of legal practice. I spent days of work on each case, doing research, writing briefs, gathering evidence, interviewing witnesses, and taking depositions, and the judge barely looked at any of it. You did a lot of excellent work. You will make a good lawyer. But most of that work will only preserve arguments for appeal. But as an intern I cannot make an appeal. Will the firm do that if I do most of the staff work? We would like to, but the firm cannot afford it. We have used our entrance to meet our quota of pro bono work. But too many clients cannot pay us. We may have to shed a few junior associates. But a couple of lawyers clearly committed malpractice. They sold out their clients to the opposition. The firm is not going to take a malpractice case against another lawyer. If we did we would never win another case in court. The judges would put us out of business. But this is one of the most prestigious law firms in the area. You even have a former partner on the bench. That would not help us if we broke any of the unspoken rules. Too many of the judges do not follow their own rules. Can we not file complaints to get them removed from the bench? That would be breaking another unspoken rule. We do not dare even criticize a judge, much less file a complaint of judicial misconduct. Are they that afraid of such complaints? Not at all. Most such complaints are just ignored. 
but in many jurisdictions the complaints are collected by the prosecutors, who use them to blackmail judges into giving them wins, by threatening to prosecute them under the complaints. So complaints of judicial misconduct may be used to produce even worse judicial misconduct. Yes. About the only kind of misconduct that seems to get attention these days is sexual harassment. One of the prosecutors hit on me, suggesting he might give me a win if I slept with him. Attractive lawyers get that a lot, and not just female lawyers. Wait until it comes from a judge. Oh my god. I thought that kind of thing was rare, but it is not. No, it is not. It was in my father's day, but now misconduct is so common that it is accepted as the new normal. Don't we as lawyers have a duty to fight back? Yes, but there will be a price to pay. I dream of doing that after I have got enough assets safely offshore, so I can afford to leave the firm. It would not be fair to them to do it before I retire. But I do not have enough assets since my wife left me and sued for divorce. It was a judge who got her to do that, after I discovered he was dirty. Cannot the state bar do something? The state bar is under the control of the judges. It was sold as a way to protect the public from bad lawyers, but it has become a way to protect bad lawyers from the public, and to suppress competition from competent laypersons. Oh my god. I cannot believe it has gotten this bad. Not all branches of legal practice are as bad. As an entity you have gotten mostly indigent clients. There is an old saying, it is better to be rich and guilty than poor and innocent. But no one is more than one false accusation from prison. Not even you or me. However, you could have an entire career in a field like corporate law in which you would never encounter most of this corruption and might come to think it does not exist. In one's case we had proof the prosecution witnesses were lying and the prosecutors knew it. But the judge would not allow us to present the evidence. It is called, test to lying. Remember, most judges are former prosecutors. And in one case a judge flat out lied to the jury about what the law was and would not allow us to prove what the law really was to the jury. It is called, instruct to lying. When the jury only gets one side on what the law is, they usually do not know enough to doubt what they are told. What can we do? The public needs to know about this. If I am ever called for jury duty, I will know, but most people will not. It is unlikely you will ever have to serve on a jury. Both sides prefer to weed out educated people, especially lawyers. They know better how to appeal to emotion and prejudice than to intelligence. You will learn that, too. How can we reach the general public? I have tried speaking to high school classes and student groups, but the word got back about what I was doing and suddenly the invitations stopped coming. Do they really reach that far? The establishment knows how to protect itself. Make the wrong arguments or other moves and you are likely to be hit with tens of thousands of dollars in sanctions, disbarred, audited, or falsely accused and prosecuted for a crime. Are there no honest judges left? There may be a few and most judges are somewhat honest in most ordinary cases. But there is a large and growing class of cases that must be called, political, in which legal merit doesn't matter. Very few judges are appointed anymore on whom the appointing officials don't have enough dirt to control them. And elected judges depend on the financial support of the big law firms. Why are more people not outraged about this? More and more are, but it is too easy to think injustice only happens to other people, until it happens to you or someone you know, and then you become so consumed by your own case that you lose sight of how the problem is systemic. So it is not just a problem of corrupt individuals? No. It once was, when there were few, but there is a tipping point after which the rotten apples spoil the whole barrel. If only more lawyers would stand up against all this. Some have tried and they deserve our admiration. But most of them are poor. There is a lot more money behind injustice than behind justice. Are lawyers just too greedy? Lawyers are not more greedy or unethical than the general public, but they need to be much better than that. However, it is not just about greed. The way the system works, one often wins by driving up the costs of the opposition until they run out of money. Justice is a lot more expensive than injustice. What will it take? 
people demonstrating in the streets? That is the only thing that seemed to work in early times. Many of the rights we can claim today came from mass public riots. A few judges had to be lynched and courthouses burned down. I hope it will not come to that again.